So uh, today I'll be telling you about our recent study of the local structure in PMN. And I will start with acknowledging my uh, main co-authors. And this is Maxim Yeremenko and Viktor Kreisman. And Maxim was actually the main uh, man on the show here. He did most of the development. Unfortunately, he had to b go back to Russia, unfortunately for us. And uh, he's trying to defend this work as a PhD thesis there. I'd also like to acknowledge other people who helped with collecting different kinds of data that we used, and as you will see, we used a lot. And so single crystal diffuse scattering was provided by Alexei Bosak from ESRF, and then various instrument scientists at different uh, facilities, Helen Playford, uh, uh, Karina Chapman, Joe Wojcik, and Bruce Ravel, they helped us with collecting different kinds of experimental signals. PMN does not need much introduction here. And so we will know that this is a classical relaxer ferroelectric material and uh, the active research trying to understand the origins of its uh, properties uh, has been ongoing for like over six decades. And certainly many people in this room have contributed to this quest. And we all know that although it looks like we're almost there and the complete understanding is near, but like no cigar yet. And so, um, there have been different models proposed, uh, bro both from a uh, uh, theoretical uh, perspective, phenomenological, and more recently based on Monte Carlo and uh, molecular dynamics, trying to explain what's going on. And there is a whole spectrum ranging from polar nanoregions uh, to nanodomains and so on. And then on the experimental side, a lot of the effort uh, focused on explaining characteristic diffuse scattering features that you see in single crystal uh, X-ray or neutron diffraction. Again, a broad spectrum of models from nanodomains to acoustic phonons. There have been propositions that this uh, diffuse scattering is intimately related to the relaxer behavior, and then there have been uh, suggestions otherwise. And so uh, the thing is ongoing. And a good indicator of this uh, ongoing debate is very recent publications and high profile uh, uh, journals like Nature, which keeps suggesting uh, new ideas and new experimental evidence, uh, but they also bring new questions and uh, we're still not quite there yet. So we thought that one uh, missing aspect of this whole business that contributes to the uncertainty is uh, uh, atomistic structural models of the kind that you can obtain from MD or, mo uh, or molecular dynamics, but that will be coming directly from experimental data. And trying to get such atomistic structural models directly from experiments was actually the subject of our work. One way that you can obtain such uh, atomistic models is uh, through structural refinements using reverse Monte Carlo. The reverse Monte Carlo method as a way to fit your experimental signals is over 30 years old, initially being developed for amorphous and uh, liquids to uh, fit neutron scattering data, and then later it was extended to crystalline materials. And the idea is that you model your instantaneous structure with a large atomic configuration, and then you start fitting your signals by moving atoms at random. And the acceptance probability for atomic moves depends on whether a particular move improves the fit or it makes it worse. If it improves the fit, it is accepted unconditionally. If it makes it worse, it can still be accepted, but with a probability that goes down exponentially with a misfit between experiment and calculated signal. And this way you hope to keep uh, your refinement out of the local minima. What are the principal advantages of using this approach for structure refinements? First of all, uh, all of the disorder, whether it's chemical or displacive, it's treated explicitly, there is no effective parameters. So it's very well suited for analysis systems with disorder like solid solutions. The second principal advantage is that any kind of signal that can be computed from atomic coordinates can be included in the fit. You just have to be able to do these calculations fast enough. And uh, the advantages come with a, a price, and the price is uh, with reverse Monte Carlo that your models become too flexible. Because you have so many variables, it's very easy to fit your data if you don't have enough data. And the ch prime challenge becomes how to provide enough data to your uh, refinement so that it would constrain uh, the correct model. And this is something that we've been preoccupied uh, over probably the last decade. Uh, 
And so we've been trying to uh, take an existing package, which became a standard package for RMC refinements called RMC Profile. And it's a joint development between uh, two teams in the UK at ISIS and Queen May University in London and also Oak Ridge and NIST. And our focus at NIST was on uh, outfitting this RMC Profile uh, software with multiple techniques capabilities. And as a result of this development today, we can simultaneously fit neutron and X-ray total scattering both on reciprocal and real spaces. And in real space, if you take total scattering and apply the Fourier transform, you get a pair distribution function. We can also include multiple extended X-ray absorption fine structure data sets. And X-ray absorption fine structure, it also probes a pair distribution function pretty much like neutron or X-ray scattering, but now it's chemically resolved. You're only looking at the local environment around the absorbing atoms. And as I will show in this work, we extended this to be able to include a single crystal diffuse scattering, including its three-dimensional distributions. So the software now can fit all of this simultaneously, and we apply this uh, machinery to PML. So this is kind of data that uh, we collected and fitted for PMN. All of these data are at room temperature. And uh, it included neutron scattering function. Fortunately, the pointer doesn't seem to be showing. But anyway, so you can see that uh, there is neutron uh, scattering function in Q space. Then there is its Fourier transform, which is a pair distribution function. The same for X-rays. X-ray S of Q and X-ray PDF. And the idea and the advantage to combine uh, neutrons and X-rays is because X-ray emphasize heavier lead and niobium. So already by combining neutrons and X-rays, you provide some chemical resolution. We found, however, that even this was not enough. Um, and we had to include lead and niobium exos to be able to be uh, sufficiently chemically selective. And then what makes this work, one aspect, what makes this work different from all of the previous RMC studies, uh, we've done this kind of data sets before for other systems, but here we combine it, all of this data, which is collected on ceramic powders, with a single crystal diffuse scattering, as measured with X-rays, on a single crystal of PMN, and we included really 3D distribution of diffuse intensity in reciprocal space, and we fitted this all together. There is another aspect that makes this work uh, different from uh, everything else that's been done with reverse Monte Carlo uh, before. And this is the size of atomic configurations that we used. You realize that with, with systems where nanoscale ordering is suspected, like PMN, where we are talking about nanoscale regions potentially between two to maybe five nanometers, your configuration size has to be adequately large. And all of the RMC refinements before, because of the limitations of computing speed, you could do maybe 20,000 atoms, maybe sample distances up to three nanometers. That's definitely not enough if you want to analyze a system with three nanometer what it means. So uh, the prime development of the last two years was increase the computing speed of RMC profile enough that now we can handle up to half a million atoms. And in this case, we used an atomic configuration of 40 by 40 by 40 unit cells for perovskite, which is just over 300,000 atoms. And that seems to be at the minimum what you need to model systems like PMAP. But that was a major development, and that's where most credit goes to Maxim for really improving the speed through various algorithmic and hardware developments. When you fit single crystal diffuse scattering, many of the works focused on reproducing the shape. This is certainly not enough because you want to reproduce how the diffuse intensity varies with your scattering vector because different models predict different dependence. And that was also possible to do here. So the three-dimensional pictures, these are just constant intensity surfaces. But this, uh, if we look at the individual traces of this distribution, we could really reproduce how the diffuse intensity changes with Q. And that is an important uh, aspect of this uh, analysis. So what do we get out after we refine and obtain these configurations? Uh, first of all, about chemical ordering. It's been known since 80s that uh, magnesium and niobium, uh, they form uh, short and short uh, regions. And these regions are manifested as diffuse spots in electron diffraction patterns at half, half, half integer locations. And then if you do dark field with these reflections, you get these speckles, which indicate that the ordering is coming from nanoregions, which are between two to five nanometers in size. 
There have been different models proposed for this uh, uh, chemical ordering, but uh, the, consensus, uh, the current consensus seems to be that the random layer, roxol type ordering, seems to be that's what's uh, going on there. And with roxol type ordering, you get uh, uh, ordering vector along one, one, one direction, and you get uh, half of the plant preferentially occupied by niobium, and the remaining half by a mixture of uh, magnesium and remaining niobium atoms. And that is something that's been known. So what we did here, we used, uh, the, we started with uh, just taking the diffuse blobs. These are pretty much spherically looking blobs of diffuse intensity at these half, half, half uh, locations. They are hidden in these pictures. So the pointer started to show up. Uh, they are hidden uh, somewhere around here. And we started just with swapping magnesium and niobium atoms to fit the intensity for these blobs. Here we made an assumption, which we had to make, that all of the intensity in these diffuse blobs is coming exclusively from chemical ordering, not from displacements. And we can discuss in the break why we had to make these assumptions, but uh, this is an assumption to keep in mind. So with this assumption, we've been doing swaps until we obtain the fit, and then uh, we calculated uh, Warren Cowley uh, like short and shorter parameter, and the way it behaves with uh, distance certainly confirms that we have this Roxol type ordering. Then we devise some sort of a local ordering metric, so we can look at how this ordering uh, is distributed spatially. And so uh, this is the metric that we devised, and it's based on considering for each of the big atoms, magnesium and niobium, we calculated its chemistry in the fourth uh, uh, successive uh, B cut and B cut and coordination shells. Again, we can go into details of this metric in the break. But uh, if you look at the three dimensional distribution of this metric shown here, it's clear that the distribution is continuous. There is no chemically ordered regions in a disordered matrix. There is no disordered matrix altogether. We just see that there are regions of uh, strong ordering, which pretty much appears fluctuations on top of the otherwise continuously varying uh, background. So pretty much they look like fluctuations of strong ordering that would uh, be quenched from high temperature, which probably they are. Or you can look at it as very wide antiphase boundaries, something like occurs frequently in metal alloys if you look uh, uh, close to the other disorder transition. We then compared our results with a uh, recent uh, study uh, from North Carolina State, and this is Jim Lebeau's work and his group. Uh, uh, Jim is now at MIT, and they use scanning TM images, which uh, um, if you look at the high angle dark field images, the intensity uh, uh, is related to the uh, atomic numbers, and then they, by devising similarly defined local metric just in 2D, they could plot how this local ordering varies across the uh, projections. And they came with the conclusion that indeed this ordering is very continuous, there is no disordered matrix. So we did the same thing and uh, calculated a similar projection like you would uh, get from the images for our refined configuration, which is shown on the left. And what we obtained was pretty much quantitative agreement with STEM results, which indicated two things. First of all, it lended support to um, uh, the TM data, showing that if you do it carefully, you can really uh, do something uh, pretty accurate. On the other hand, it really supported that the procedure we've been using also makes sense and whatever ordering we are getting uh, is uh, probably not far from the truth. So being satisfied with chemical ordering, we turn to uh, cation displacements, which were of most interest. And these two stereographic projection maps uh, indicate the uh, uh, directions of displacements for lead and niobium. And you can see there is a clear preference for the two to be along one, one, one directions, as many studies have suggested. And there are actually strong correlations, again, as you would expect, between lead and niobium displacements. We then did uh, what I would call a sanity check, and we checked how the magnitude of lead displacements in our configuration varies with the number of magnesium ions around lead. And we found that more magnesium you have around lead, larger lead displacements, and that seems to make uh, uh, intuitive crystal chemical sense, because first of all, magnesium is larger ion, so the cages around lead become uh, larger when you have more magnesium, and at the same time, oxygen atoms become stronger under-coordinated if you have more magnesium compared to niobium, also promotes stronger displacements of lead. So it seems to me that we are reproducing at least uh, some basic crystal chemical trends. 
Then we turned into the alignment and correlation between the displacements of lead, and we focused mostly on lead rather than on niobium because lead displacements are larger, just easier to analyze. So we devised uh, a local alignment metric for the lead displacements, which is illustrated here. And this was an average angle between the displacement vector of a given lead atom and the displacement vectors of its lead neighbors in the first coordination shell, or if you wish, you can extend it to high order shells. And if this metric is equal to zero, there is a perfect alignment of uh, this lead with its neighbors, and if it's 180, it's anti-parallel. And then we plotted this uh, metric, uh, we calculated it for each of the lead atoms and plotted in 3D. So here we only plot those lead atoms for whom this metric is less than 45 degrees, so their displacements are locally aligned. What we did then, we ran a, a clustering algorithm which actually checks how dense these uh, lead atoms in space are and do they actually form dense clusters. And these colors, different colors in this uh, three-dimensional uh, cartoon uh, correspond to uh, spatially distinct clusters of lead and within each cluster the displacements are locally parallel. When I say locally parallel, I literally mean locally parallel the overall, it may curl or may exhibit different patterns, so it's, they are not like moving all upwards or all downwards, but locally they are aligned. Then we started to look what happens within these individual clusters, which we can call polar nanoregions. And the first thing we analyzed was how the, display, uh, the magnitude of lead displacements correlates with the degree of alignment, of local alignment. And we found that there is a clear correlation that better the alignment, smaller this angle, larger the displacements. The other thing which was clear is that the transition from one PNR to another was very smooth. It was just gradual change, like shown in this trace in the displacement magnitude along the boundary. Again, there was no disordered matrix. Everything was continuous, just smooth transition. After this, we mapped these 111 displacements of lead, and there are eight directions, onto these larger PNRs. And what we found, that each of these PNRs is an aggregate of two or three regions of smaller size, like shown here. This is already not a contour, uh, uh, cartoon. This is actually an actual extraction of, for one of these clusters. And uh, in each of these regions, the displacements occur along its given 111 direction, and there was a very clear preference for the adjacent regions to be 71 degrees domain variance as opposed to 109 degree. It was very clear preference. And this result agrees very well with the recently published work from Andrew Rappers group, uh, Takenaka and uh, co-authors, who observed from uh, their molecular dynamics work that uh, there is a very similar picture going on, which again suggests that what we are seeing all together in uh, whether it's their simulations or the experimental models, it's probably not a fluke and it's real. I forgot to include the, the extra slide I wanted to include, but we're also interested to check where the diffuse intensity, these characteristic shapes are coming from. And what we did in this regard, we used the inverse uh, Fourier filtering, like it's usually done with high resolution TM. So the approach here, you just take your uh, diff uh, diffuse scattering and you mask certain regions of reciprocal space allowing your characteristic shapes, and you do the Fourier transform into real space. And then by analyzing this uh, Fourier transform, you can actually tell where the strongest contribution to diffuse scattering comes from. This becomes uh, much trickier when you do it in 3D than you do it in 2D for images, and it required a lot of testing, but we figured out the procedure and we confirmed pretty much unambiguously that these features, the diffuse scattering features come from such aggregates of domains. They are not coming from one of the domains or other things. They are really a function of these aggregates of 71 degrees domain variance. And again, this agrees very well with the proposition uh, in Takenaka's paper where they suggested that this diffuse scattering is coming from the multi-domain state. And we see that, but now we can tell what these multi-domains are. We then did the comparison and trying to find if there is any spatial correlation between uh, PNRs 
and chemically ordered regions, and these are uh, projections of our configuration, and the displacements show uh, displacements of projected columns. And we observed that there was no actually spatial correspondence between the two. And uh, in every case, uh, uh, the size of PNRs was substantially larger than the size of the chemically ordered regions. If you can define it, it becomes not so easy to define these chemically ordered regions because it's all continuous. In addition to room temperature, we've also done the analysis at 200 Kelvin, and we observed this uh, polar nanoregions grow. Now their size, uh, size went up to about five, six nanometers or so. Uh, we felt, however, that the atomic configurations that we've been using, 40 by 40 by 40 unit cells, was probably not enough to model such large domains. And uh, you would like to go bigger. Like in Takenaka's work, they've been using 72 by 72 by 72, uh, but uh, this was a bit too much. Oh, shit. Sorry, Sorry for that. Get it back on track. Right, so the, uh, the configurations are. Uh, we try to use 72, but it's a bit too much for the computing power we have at the moment. Um, so we think that the results that we obtained for 200 kel uh, Kelvin, they're more qualitative than quantitative. The final thing that I would like to discuss is the recent results from Newton, uh, from this Nature Materials paper, where they analyzed uh, Newton diffuse scattering, and they observed that there is an asymmetry of diffuse scattering uh, for uh, really not working, for even order reflections, and you don't see this as asymmetry for odd uh, orders. You have it, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's. Yeah. So you see that there is an asymmetry here for like uh, order four, and it's symmetric for order three. And this asymmetry was missing in the X-rays, which uh, made them to conclude that this asymmetry is coming from oxygen displacements. And similarly, it's been overlooked before, and there is something potentially important and interesting. So what we did, we just calculated this neutron diffuse scattering for our configuration, even though we did not fit the neutrons. But when we did these calculations, we found that we can reproduce this asymmetry perfectly well. It's asymmetric for four and symmetric for three. And if we calculate it for X-rays, um, it conforms to our data, everything is symmetric, as it should be. And by doing the analysis, we, indeed, we confirm that this asymmetry is coming from oxygen displacements. Then we started to look at the, uh, for correlations between oxygen displacements and oxygen cation displacements in our configurations. And we had to develop like whole analysis of octahedral deformations to analyze the oxygen. But what we found, that there are uh, correlations which really resemble um, typical low frequency polar modes, like I show here. These are the correlations we found. So there, are, there is a correlated oxygen motion uh, in addition to the cations, and they're coupled. And we think that this is these correlations that actually give rise to this asymmetry. And this is something perfectly expected. Uh, indeed, you would expect to have these modes and correlated oxygen motion. And there is nothing uh, particularly special about that. That's something that you would expect to see with neutrons as opposed to X-rays. So to wrap up the story, uh, first of all about the technique. Uh, we think that now RMC profile is really ready to handle systems with nanoscale ordering, and it becomes applicable to many classes of uh, uh, relaxers or ferroelectric materials that we could not read before. We found that combining 3D diffuse with powder data is extremely powerful. Once you include 3D diffuse, it's not 2D sections. It really nails the correlations down, and it helps a lot. And this is something that's worth uh, investing into it. Certainly, this is just a fourth example. You need to develop the infrastructure better and so on. And maybe it takes more time. But really, when you have everything accounted by one model, it eliminates a lot of uncertainties. And in the end, it saves time and, and discussion. Certainly, besides uh, its own value, these RMC refinements from experiments provide nice uh, comparison points for MD or uh, Monte Carlo, which can be used. And uh, at the moment, we're actually working, trying to combine, uh, to incorporate energetics from uh, uh, DFT-related uh, into RMC refinements as an additional constraint. 
On the PMN side, we see that there is certainly no discrete chemically ordered regions or PNRs. Everything is continuous and appears more like storm fluctuations rather than discrete regions. We identify this composite, what we call hierarchical polar non-regions, which consists preferentially of 71 degree uh, variance. And it's interesting to understand why is it 71 as opposed to 109. There are some arguments that we can make, but it's all uh, more of the hands waving at the moment. The modulated diffuse cutting that people see with neutrons uh, seems to be coming just from the correlated oxygen displacements, which are parts of polar modes coupled to cation displacements. And that is, uh, we think that's their origin, nothing particularly special. And so we also have done inverse Fourier transform to analyze where the antiferroelectric uh, related scattering comes from. And we see that there are bits of this antiferroelectric like ordering, uh, not of the usual types, and it's mostly the components of displacement that form this. The analysis is complicated because uh, the scattering that comes from the antiferroelectric points, it really it overlaps with the diffuse scattering ridges uh, coming from the uh, uh, polar nanodomains or nanoregions. So it becomes difficult to do it very conclusively, just there is no way to isolate it. And uh, at the moment, we are planning to extend this work to PMNPT. We actually have a proposal funded. So actually, in two weeks, we are starting to do some measurements on PMNPT system. And we want to see what's going on there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, let me just start with a question. So, so is there a, a good way to say something about uh, uncertainties in the, in the models? Like uh, if you start from different configurations, you end up with the same, uh, obviously it wouldn't be exactly the same, I assume. Yeah, obviously every time you start, because it's a snapshot, it should be different. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, what should not change is the uh, characteristics that you extract from it. Mm -hmm. And the characteristic seems to be pretty reproducible, uh, regardless of the start. You just have to remember that systematic errors are also reproducible, mm -hmm. and inevitably there are errors in your data. In a way, the, uh, the problem with all of these refinements becomes that normally you would like to get a good fit. That's the idea of the refinements. However, you know that all of these data have systematic errors, so actually you don't want to get such a good fit. Where you stop becomes a challenge. We think that qualitatively the results hold, Quantitatively, I would not, uh, you know, we don't know the actual uncertainties, so the numbers I would treat with uh, that in mind. I, I, just to follow up, so, so if you start with really different sorts of models, like uh, ones with PNR, without PNR, I mean, do you end up with the same type of solution in the end? We have not uh, tried that, because uh, it also becomes, uh, let's say, generating realistic models as a start is a project in its own. Because if you start with something completely unrealistic, it may just get locked there and may never get out. So, mm -hmm. we, so we have not tried that. Let's okay. put it this way. Okay. We have time for more questions. I, I, let me pass around the mic, too. Now, with the uh, uh, recent advancement in high resolution TEM, which you can map the charge distribution in such a nanostructure. Uh, has anybody tried, or are you going to try to map, you know, is there any charge distribution or difference between the polar nano region and away from the polar nano region? I thought that was really an important question, which, you know, it's been going on for a long time. But uh, I, I, did, I don't know, is there any information also you can get from your experiment and simulation? Well, basically, we have atomic coordinates, right? So if we would include information about uh, charges, or, uh, and that's something that we uh, sometimes do. For example, we can take Born effective charges, things like that, and uh, calculate whatever you want, like uh, polarization distribution and things like that. So once you have atomic coordinates, we can add uh, any kind of additional information about charges and calculate whatever uh, field or map we are interested in. What about directly imaging using TEM? You know, right, it's certainly possible to include, um, we cannot simulate images that would take uh, way too long. But if from imaging you can extract certain maps of certain characteristic that can be calculated, that's definitely possible. So,
So, um, you know the diffuse scattering responds very strongly to the presence of an electric field. Do you have any uh, plans to try studies of electric field? Because you're combining single crystal data as well. And then the, uh, just the second question is, uh, do you have any comment on the skin effect? Because for certain concentrations of PMNPT, uh, in bulk samples it remains cubic to low temperatures, where if, if you look at powders, it, it shows a rhombohedral distortion. So about the first question uh, about electric field. We certainly have it in the plans for PMNPT as a part of it, and my collaborator is actually an expert in applying electric field and doing the fraction and single crystals. With powders, we've done it as well in the past, not for PMN, but we've done in situ total scattering experiments. It becomes extremely challenging to interpret this data because everything becomes anisotropic, and there is no, um, there are just only very primitive ways to interpret this data, let's put it this way. And a lot of hands waving, you cannot really model it properly. And there is like an intrinsic challenge that is, uh, say, almost impossible to overcome. Uh, yeah, sorry, the uh, second question, right, was about the, the... The skin effect, because if you look at large enough crystals, they, they give answers that don't agree with more surface-sensitive probes like x-rays. Uh, I think that Alexei Bosak actually was taking great care in doing these measurements, and that's why I would like to work with him, because yeah. he knew that that's probably one of the better uh, data reduction that you can get. That's my, my answer. There are certainly issues if you don't take care. Yes. Uh, beautiful talk, thanks. I'm confused about time scales. So should I think of your structures as instantaneous snapshots or averaged over some interval of time? I mean, the experiments may have different time scales that they see. This is, uh, we treat it as a snapshot. Uh, in terms of X-rays or exhausts, uh, there is no question they provide you instantaneous data. With neutrons, it becomes a bit tricky because you tend to integrate over energy window. We actually had to go to like whole argument to argue that we are capturing, we just have enough energy integrating to capture low frequency events. But that becomes uh, uh, a serious question when you do neutrons, which uh, needs to be considered. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I'm convinced this is really the milestone in the research of uh, uh, relaxers and PMN. It's, it's obvious. I just um, have this question um, uh, following maybe the previous questions about uh, how sure we are that this is the right picture. Uh, if you fitting data and you put too many parameters, then some parameter may be correlated, and that is some way to find the correlations in the model. And here, you know, the, the, what is like parameters is the position of atoms. Could you somehow think, if there is some either a mathematical method or you have some intuition, what could be the, the value of the changing of the structure to something which equally well fits your data, but it would be different? There are indeed many factors that go in, and uh, you should remember that all of these, data, besides having systematic errors, what is being minimized is the total aggregate residual function, right? And each data set acquires its weight, and the weight has to be assigned somehow. We have developed like automated procedure, which I would call semi-rigorous. There is no really, I don't know of any rigorous way of doing it. Uh, I would say that requires certainly research, uh, but we have some way of including it which uh, makes procedure more robust. Like I said before, I would be trusting the qualitative aspects. I would be um, less certain about specific numbers, whether the domain size is this and not that. But um, in terms of assessing the uncertainties, um, again here, speed becomes there are many factors that can bias the results, but uh, uh, my feeling is that a qualitative thing is that's it. And what plays a big role here, I wouldn't be so sure if we just had the powder data. The 3D diffuse scattering really it just eliminates, even all of these systematic errors is just so powerful that it takes care of a lot of things, in my opinion. That's why it's so important to include it if you can. 
So with powder, there are indeed many possibilities you can do. It. You put it all together, I doubt that. That uh, would be my answer. But it's, uh, it's certainly, that's another factor where computing speed is important. If you can do things much faster, you can do much more testing, you can test for much more effects. If it, you, you have to wait, like, I don't know, six months to get the result, that's not going to work, right? Here, it was taken on our cluster about maybe three weeks for a configuration to converge, which is not that bad. Well, like three weeks, you can run multiples. But, but I would say that we, we become really limited by computing speed, and it's not like we don't know how to do it better, it's just you know getting funding and people who for that much of funding can do the work for you.